Hi guys, it's Gage Maverick with Gage TV Travel and Leisure and we are here at the Hungry Hawk Winery. I'm standing next to this gentleman here who's kind of important around here. What is your name, <laughs> sir? My name is Ed Enbley. I'm the owner. My wife and I are the owners of the vineyard here and the winery and my son's the winemaker. Now, if it is my very first time, so Gage TV viewers, this is my very first time to visit a winery. What would you tell me, uh, how, do, how do, what's the best way to experience this if it's my very first time doing this? Well, I, I mean, a tour really gives you an in-depth idea of how, what we do, what, what, how all the work that's involved with making wine, and all the different uh, variations that you can have between different wines. Uh, I mean, I, uh, the different factors that influence the final flavor of wine are, are numerous. Okay, and so you've got a tour available for us? Yes, we do. Let's take the tour. Come along, guys. We're going to go on a tour right now. Join us in just a minute. Owned this? How long have you been a winemaker? Oh, we've had the property for 16 years. We started planting grapes about oh, 10 years ago, and our tasting room's been open about five and a half years now. Now, did you have any experience uh, in the wine business prior to this, or was this kind of a, I'll just kind of try this later in life and see what happens? Not really. It started out as a hobby, really. A hobby? It, it kind of grew from there. Yes. That's an expensive hobby, sir. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, what made you decide to start this? So you just said it was kind of a hobby. What was your kind of inkling to get rolling? Well, well, what really got us started is the government will, will allow anybody to produce 200 gallons of wine for their personal consumption without the requirement of a permit or licensing or anything like that. So that kind of sounded interesting to me uh, in retirement. Something. Like that. <laughs> but you're not a wino, correct? Yeah, yeah. There's no, a difference right. between winery and wino, right? Yes, yes. Although sometimes I could probably be considered a wino because I do enjoy wine. But you'd get away with it because you own the winery. Yes, yes. Almost yes. like a justification for that, right? Now, I did have that question rolling in. Hungry Hawk. Now, yes. being this is a winery, wouldn't it be Thirsty Hawk? No, Hungry Hawk. Because when we bought this property 16 years ago, it was covered with a 50 year old avocado trees. And so we, before we could really do anything with it, because they're past their prime, we had to cut down the trees. Well, an interesting fact about red tail hawks, they'll mate for life and they'll live up to 50 years of age. So it's still the same hawk that was here originally. Oh. And so getting back to my story is that when we started cutting down the trees, the, the hawks are very intelligent animals, intelligent animals. And so any time that they would see us heading out into the trees to cut them down, mm -hmm. to clear the property, uh, they would find a, a convenient perch nearby to see if we would scare out any food for them. So these are the beginning of the sprouts? Yes, yes. for sure. And this will be uh, what color grapes? Yeah, white grapes. These well, are white grapes. Actually, it's a Pinot Gris, so it's kind of a gray, gray colored grape. So I, here's what I'm also learning. You gotta be. In, uh, I was kind of thinking about the uh, the hawk story. So yeah. you're kind of combining zoology with botan, bot uh, being a botanist. Yeah. And well, then, uh, what what is a what is the scientific term for a winemaker? Enologist. Uh, so what? Enologist. 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 So so you went from zoologist to botanist to. Well, actually, out in the vineyard, they're venticulturalists. Venticulturalist. Now that yes, is a yes, multi-syllabic yes. term. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be able to say, and I'm only one tasting in. Yes. Now, what was it called? A winemaker is a whatologist? Enologist. I N E N E Enologist. Did you know that, Gage TV viewers? Grape, I did not I, know that. I believe the grape in Greek is E N O. Eno. So Enologist. This man right here is. Could a, be Latin. It's, he, it's one of those. He is a many thingologist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he does many things, and again, and, and one thing with a plant, any of the grapes that are grown are on the new, the new growth. 
So the old growth just is really a support system for the new growth and that's where the, the clusters will develop and that's where the grapes will come. And so how long have these been here? Uh, this, this particular vine probably is six years old. Six? Yes. And you're still supporting it? Pretty much they need support quite a while. And so you said in a month this thing will fruitfully develop? Yeah, it'll be a big push. And then this planting, I think the first five rows here it's the Grenache varietal. Uh, the European, all the plants that we have here are European varietals. Uh, both the Grone, Burgundy, uh, in the French side, we have some uh, Spanish varietals and also some Italian varietals. And what sets them apart? And is it is it about how do you designate the two, or how do you, or the, the different, you talk about the Grenache, yeah. uh, Spanish, how do you? Well, I mean, you know, you, you go through an order book and what it is, all the vines that we have, basically a European varietal grafted onto an American rootstock. Now the reason for the American rootstock, and you can see that little knot that's about four inches off the ground. Yes. That's the graft union joint. And so we use an American grapevine and we graft that European grapevine on it because the, the American grapevine is much more resistant to any of the soil diseases that we might have in the area. And that can be uh, phylloxera, which is one of the things that kind of wiped out the whole industry worldwide at one point, and also nematode. And is that, isn't that a bug? The, the, the nematode? The, yeah, they're all they're both. Bugs. I remember that from science yeah. class. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, science teacher yeah. in seventh grade. Yeah. It stuck. But they they can over time uh, kill off grapevines here, just a little bit. And that's here. Let's look out over here and show the viewers. Is this a year-round or is this a seasonal operation? Very seasonal. Yeah, everything happens once a year. Uh, right now you can see that the plants are just starting to come out of dormancy. These are starting to bud also. Bud break would be what that's called. And let's go in on that, zoom in on that. And what is the season? Um, well, now we have bud break uh, and these these shoots will grow for the next six months and our harvest season normally starts first of August and since we have so many different varieties our harvest season will run through the end of October. Holy so cow. we really have three months of harvest and that's one thing nice about having so many different varietals that they don't all ripen at the same time so it spreads out the amount of work we have. So you do have some kind of rotationary yes. kind yes. of methods here. Right. All right, so you had mentioned this will yield how many tons? This potential yield on a Grenache variety like this at this age, 14 or 15 tons per acre. Now, as that relates to a bottle of wine, yes. how do you whittle that down to? A ton of grapes will produce about 150 gallons of wine, which is equivalent to about, uh, oh, that would be about 75 cases. 70, bottle, 75 cases. cases and that's 12 bottles per case right. each bottle is how many ounces uh 750 milliliters 700 oh he yeah. went to europe <laughs> see now we he switched over on the metric system yeah, I know. <laughs> a case is 20, we went from gallons to milliliters a, ed a, a case is is really the equivalent of about nine liters which equals about a two and a half gallon Okay, see, stay with me on the gallon, see, because he, he switched on me. You saw that, right? He switched? <laughs> it, I said it was going to be a math question, but then he actually changed systems on me. Now, on that note, if, if I'm going to Ralph's and I'm buying grapes, do these grapes have a name? Like, would I see them in the grocery store? Are they the same? commercial grade grapes that I'm eating when I go? Our, our, our wine grapes are small and a lot of seed, a lot of skin, but if they are in the grocery store, they'd normally be labeled a champagne grape. Champagne grape. So yeah. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try to go to my local store, it rhymes with Ralph's, <laughs> and maybe get champagne grapes and maybe, taste. Maybe. Maybe. They don't, they, I mean, they don't always Because I see the big, big yeah, they're diff totally different grapes. Different grapes. Those, those big eating grapes, table grapes, have a sugar content of maybe 11, 12%. Mm -hmm. Wine grapes, um, 23 to 25% sugar. They're smaller, but they have a higher sugar. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's wow. kind of just pretty much dilution. Really? Larger size, the same amount of sugar per grape, but it has a lot more fluid in it. 
Holy cannoli. Well, that might be tasty to eat because I like sweet. Oh, yeah, but yeah. The, the seeds can kind of yeah, get in the way. That's it. I don't like the seeds. Yeah. They're making them without seeds now. Not wine grape. No? No. Would that help? If, would the, a seed no, because, grape help you? Or no, you said it, it, it helps in it the, does something with it, the... Yeah, it helps the flavor profile and okay. the tannins. Yeah, that's what makes the difference between whites and red. Ah. This is where it all happens here, guys. Yeah. We're here at Hungry Hawk uh, Winery up here in uh, Escondido or down here, depending on where you're viewing from. This is where it all happens right here, and, and the next step from here, we're going into the barrel room. Barrel room, and that's really, you know, if you taste the wine in those bins right after the fermentation finish, it's kind of um, how would you say very rough, 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 a raw. Yes, yeah. yes. So it doesn't have that finished red red wine flavor to it. And that's where the barrel room and the barrel aging. I'm looking forward to that yes. part because that's part of the aging and part of the sort of take where the taste profiles yes. come yes. in. Like, that's right? where it softens the grapes. All right, we're going in. We just left the barrel room in which there were how many barrels in there? There's about 75. And that 75 will, has been, some of them have been sitting there for how long? Oh, up to two years. Up to two years. And so there's a, they've got numbers, they've got a system on there, a computer system that the winemaker decides which barrel is opening next and it goes into these bottles. Right. We have arrived at the moment where I've been doing this wrong all day long. So Ed, what is the proper technique process? Take us through that. Well, I guess the first thing you want to do, you don't want to slurp it. So do you not want to you don't want to serve it. So especially in a red wine, what you you really want to try and do is accomplish is get the the aroma out of the wine. So by swirling it in the glass, you'll you'll aerate a little bit and release some of the aromas in the wine. So once you've done that, uh, you can tip the glass a little bit and put your nose actually in the glass a little somewhat. And what am I, what am I, what what am I looking for? You're looking for the aromas, and a lot of times you're going to make that, this particular one that I'm drinking, a Cabernet Sauvignon, you might get a black cherry, or you might get, get some currant, something, something like that, so you get a lot of variation from it. So it, it really has to do with letting it aerate and being able to enjoy the aroma that comes off of okay. swirling your wine. Okay. Uh, a wine glass really has a stem, so you don't heat it up. So basically, if you fold it uh, a little ways down the stem, you're not transferring that heat to your wine. Oh. Probably more important than a white wine, which is normally sort of cool. But uh, with the red wine, um, you know, you don't want, especially white wine, you don't want to grab the glass like that. Man, I have totally been doing that. Yeah, so you okay. grab it by the stem. All right. And then that, that's about it. That's the main point. Now, what is the, someone talked to me about, was it striations or yeah, what's the, the, the term? Legs, the legs. Now, how, what is that about? Well, that, that's about the amount of alcohol normally. Uh, these glasses, you can see some, but if you swirl it, get it coated there, uh, you'll see the legs down. And normally, the closer together they are, we have more legs, the higher the alcohol content. Oh. It's not always, but yeah, it, it's it's somewhat a rule for me. Alright, so let's do it all together. Do it with me. Let's do it like from start to finish. This is the proper method of wine tasting as taught to us by Ed here at Hungry Hot. Alright? So, give it a good swirl. Inhale the aroma of the wine, and then, of course, you have to taste it. Cheers. Cheers. And that's how it's done, from the expert right there, who's, by the way, a three-time Purple Heart Marine. He didn't tell us that on camera, but I'm going to say that now. We want to thank you for your service, and thank you for your time today. We appreciate you. Guys, remember to stay engaged to Gage TV. We'll see you next time. Simplify, baby. <laughs>